Okay, so I wanted to say a few things about lab four. So the first thing is, uh, you'll notice I added uh, data sheets for the DC motor and the each bridge on Dropbox. I forgot to point that out last time. The motor, uh, one of the things, there's a little uncertainty here with regard to how you read the encoder value. Okay, so this page has the pin numbers and then uh, you can see an output waveform here. Okay, so there's, there's two outputs, uh, C1 and C2, and they're two different phases of the encoder. And uh, the waveform is shown here and um, you can see that they're, they're highlighting the period of this, of this waveform. They're measuring rising edge to rising edge. And then they have the other phase is offset by one half of T. So it's 180 degrees out of phase. It's not what this is showing though, because you know if T is this, then one half T would be this, right? <laughs> but yet they're showing it as really small. So it's not the scale. Uh, but these are out of phase. But both of these signals are showing the same thing. The reason why there's two is so you can determine which direction the motor is going, okay? Now for this lab, it only needs to go one direction, okay? So you don't necessarily have to look at both of them. But the important thing is that you have to be able to measure this um, period. Does that make sense? So you can use the clock, the, the, the performance, uh, sorry, just a uh, performance counter for that. So the performance counter will allow you to just count the number of clock cycles from rising edge to rising edge. And that will give you a period. Once you have the period, then you have to convert it to RPMs. And so the way you do that is uh, you have to consider that you're going to have one pulse for each 12th of a rotation. Okay, because there's, there's 12... So as the motor, as the internal motor shaft turns, it should have 12 of these periods to complete one rotation, okay? And then you have to convert the clock cycles to seconds, right? So if you have like say a thousand clock cycles, the amount of time in seconds would be a thousand divided by CPU frequency, which is 50 megahertz, 50 million. Right, so if there's a thousand cycles, this would be a thousand fifty millionths of a second, right? Make sense? Okay, so I mean, how do you measure this? How do you know where the rise, how do you detect rising edges or falling edges for that matter? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I think the easiest way to do it would be just be to read the pin. Okay, re you read the pin once per trip through your loop, right? Because your program runs in an infinite loop. Every time you go through, you read, you read the pin. Um, and then at the end of the loop, you can set the value that you read to the old value, right? So that way you have an old value and a current value, right? And so if the old value is zero and the current value is one, that, that's the way that you detect the rising edge. Make sense? Okay, so, and then you have to measure the time from rising edge to rising edge. And so that's the idea. If you can do that, then you can get the, uh, the speed. Uh, now there's a few, um, a, a few things though that you should keep in mind. <clears throat> so when I did it, oops, sorry. Um, when I wrote my solution for this, uh, last last year, I was trying, my, one of my goals was to develop a, I wanted to develop a model for the motor, an S-domain model. <clears throat> because we don't have a model, model, a model for the motor would give you an idea of what you can expect it to do for a given input value, right? We don't really know that right now. So I recorded, I gave it an input waveform that went from zero to 100% power and then down to negative 100% power in a reverse direction and then back up to zero. So that's the blue line. And then this orange line was the, the calculated rotational speed that I read using that encoder signal. 
And you can see that it's a little wonky. <laughs> it's not real smooth. And so I, as, because it wasn't smooth, I couldn't, um, I couldn't, well, I was trying to build an S domain, a Laplace model for this. But Laplace models don't work well. Like, for example, if, you're, if you want to say that, you know, you have to basically spin it up to 0.4 before the thing moves at all. Right, there's this weird non-linearity here, right? With regards to like, a, it's like a threshold. It's like saying, you gotta put in a 0.4 power before the motor even starts turning. And then once you get to, you know, about 0.6 is where I think it kind of maxes out, right, it's speed. And um, the rotational speed is here. So if you look at this axis, it's going from zero to about 100 RPMs. Now this is the external sh shaft. So the external shaft is rotating 50 times slower than the internal shaft because of the gearbox. Okay, you can you can track the, the external shaft or the internal shaft speed, it doesn't matter, but in this lab the goal is to try to get to control the external shaft because we're building a clock and we want the second hand to go around uh, once per minute or, or whatever, whatever we set that to be. Okay, so it makes sense. So now you might say, well, wait a minute, is this, is this noisiness because of the encoder? Is this the motor doing that or is that your code? I don't know, I still haven't figured that part out. I mentioned this lab is a little experimental. <laughs> I think this might have been my own problem. I think I might have been sampling the motor too slowly. I think I was only sampling it at 100 hertz. I was only sampling one, once every millisecond. So that might explain some of this. But you guys might come up with a better solution, a better way to do it. Uh, and by the way, the way I got this plot was I just printed, I just logged my results and printed them to the console. And then I captured the console output and I just opened it in MATLAB. Or you could open an Excel too if you want to. It's not it's not hard to get the plot. You just log the values to a comma separated value text. You can log them. So this isn't this isn't pretty easy to generate. I, I wrote a uh, Python script to do this too. I haven't tested it though. I was going to send that out. Um, so you could just type Neos2 terminal and type it to the Python script, and then it would literally just generate that for you in real time. That was my. I'll send that out. I've got a version of that I can send. Uh, any questions about that? Does it make sense? Now, the input, by the way, this is a PWM duty cycle. Um, and so what this is supposed to give you is a this value times 6 volts is actually the input. This is a DC motor. So you, it, unlike a brushless motor where you have to send it like a three phases of an AC signal to make it go, the DC motor is simpler. It's, it's actually got just a DC input. And so the motor is a six volt motor. So you plug six volts into the H bridge and then you just put a piece, piece fast, sorry, pulse width modulated signal into the H bridge and that will translate the six volts into some portion of six volts as determined by the PWM, All right? And because it's an H bridge, you can, you can have forward or backwards because it's an H. So depending on, depending on, um, which leg? Right. It, depending on which leg, it'll go forward or backwards, right? Uh, so the, the the bridge has two paths. Um, I have a picture of that here. Uh, yeah. So this is the H bridge. Um, so the H bridge has two paths that are controlled by two pairs of transistors. So this transistor controls the path like this, and these two transistors B control this path, right? Now you only want to use one pair at a time. If you use, so they're mutually exclusive. You can only use, a, you can only send your PWM to IA or to IB. Not to, I don't know what happens if you try to, if, if you do them at the same time, then that's probably not good. <laughs> that's, it's not going to be good for the H bridge, right? So you just want to use one or the other. And the H bridge has a thing called IA and IB, which is just your straight up PWM from the FPGA. And then the motor has, uh, and then the H bridge has OA and OB, which are the output pins on the H bridge. And the motor has M1 and M2, which are its inputs that you short those to, right? Make sense? So the H bridge has IA and IB are inputs, and then OA and OB are the outputs. Those outputs are wired to the M1 and M2 on the motor, okay? Now, I, I, I amended this data sheet today because I noticed something in the, in the data sheet. 
So if I go back to Dropbox and I open up the data sheet for the motor. Now, and by the way, some of this is in, I think it's Korean or Chinese. <laughs> Can't read it all. But um, I noticed that if you look at this schematic, this schematic is trying to show how these waveforms are generated. So this V out is this voltage out here, the, the square wave, right? And I don't understand what reg is, and I don't know what these things, these components are. I don't know what any of these things are. But I noticed that VCC is 5 volts or 3.3 volts here, right? And VCC, there's a VCC input right here on the input, right? Now, in the last lecture, I told you to connect the VCC. Um, sorry, over here. I told you to connect VCC to the VCC on the motor. I told you to connect it to the six volt power supply, right? But I think in hindsight, I think that's wrong. I think you actually want to connect the VCC on the motor to the 3.3 volt right on the FPGA board. Because I think the VCC on the motor is powering the encoder, which is that square wave thing, right? We want that square wave to be 3.3 volts, right? The six volt is actually not connected to anything except for the H bridge, and then the H bridge then will translate that out to the motor, right? So the motor is going to get up to six volts if you max out the H bridge output, right? But that six volts is just for turning the motor. The VCC on the motor, the pin on the motor is just for the encoder. And so that might also be why I got that funky waveform is because I was using the wrong VCC for the encoder. I might have been overvolting that because I, I believe the, the FPGA is 3.3 um, volts. The, 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 well, when I say FPGA, I mean the, the GPIO pin specifically. I think they're set up to 3. Point. Although we can check that actually. Let's check that. So notice that the... over. Over here, yeah, well, the, 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 the GPIO connector does have five and 3.3 volt outputs, but the question is, what is the input expecting here in terms of voltage? So notice that I'm using GPIO two and three for the encoder square wave, right? If you go back to Dropbox and you open up the pin assignments, the Cordis project settings file. Now this is the file you use when you create your Cordis project. These are all the pins. And you'll notice that some of the pins, like the LED pins, are actually two and a half volts, the LEDs, you know, the ones in the bottom row that you guys have been using. But if we look for GPIO, okay, yeah, GPIO is 3.3 volts, right? So I think if you connect the motor's VCC to the 3.3 output pin on the, on the GPIO connector, that's a better signal to use if you're reading Remember, we're using GPIO 2 and 3, right, for the square wave, and those are 3.3 volt. I don't know if you can change this, by the way. I've been trying to figure this out for years, because um, these, these, these I.O. pins on the FPGA are configurable. I think you can make them 2.5 volts, 3.3 volts, differential, or you can make them tri-state. I think you can even configure them for tri-state if you wanted to do an I-squared-C output, but I don't know how to do that. I tried changing these things, and I got an error. So I'm not, I never figure out how to change the standard, but the way it's set up now for our current setup is 3.3 volts. That make sense? And you can use them for an input, they're, in, they're input output pins. So you can use them for inputs or outputs. Um, of course, we're using the first two for output and the second two for input. The first two are controlling the PWM and the second two are the encoder input. You know what? PTL stands for and LVTTL. Low voltage transistor transistor logic. Okay. That's that's the name of the ah. three, that's the code name for 3.3 volt signal logic. Makes sense. But we're not actually using trans we're using CMOS, but that's the anachronistic name they give a 3.3 volt signal because when they first started using 3.3 volts, it was transistor transistor logic. Cool. <clears throat> okay. Uh, da -da -da. What's the two and a half called? Just two and a half <laughs> volts. So whenever they have 3.3, they say LVTTL, but if it's two and a half, they just say two and a half volts. And then some of these are LVDS. So LVDS is low voltage differential signal. This is the HMC. This is the other connector on the board, the high speed mezzanine connector, HS HSMC. And every bit has a 
negative and a positive and an N and a P, and those flip back and forth. So that way you can run those at higher speed because they reject noise because because those, those wires are run next to each other. So if a radio frequency hits them and puts noise, it hits them both. So when you subtract them, you look at the difference, cancels out the noise. That's called common, common mode noise rejection. So that's, these are differential. But this is the other connector on the board that we're not using. And I have no idea how fast that'll run. Probably it's 500 megahertz, something like that. I don't think it'll go to gigahertz. It's not gigahertz speed, but it'll do. It will go much faster than the uh, single-ended ones that we've using now. All right, any any questions about that? Okay, so one other thing I want to go over here is I have the so this is the connection diagram. So like I said, I changed this. I, I changed this VCC to go down to this 3.3 volt. I mean, it worked with six volts. Um, in fact, there is a resistor there. Uh, if you look at the if you go back and you look at that data sheet again for the DC motor, they have a pull-up resistor, uh, but it's only 3.3 kilo ohms. So, like basically, um, what they're doing this is an open collect, this is an open drain. Like uh, remember we talked about this with I squared C. So they can pull it down to ground, right? They can pull this signal down to ground by turning that transistor on. If they turn the transistor off, then it gets pulled up to VDD, but it gets pulled up through this 3.3 kilo ohm resistor. So there'll be a little bit of a voltage drop here. But I calculated that if the off resistance of that is one mega ohm, then this will create a voltage divider where you only drop a few, you know, a few millivolts right over here. So in other words, if you connect VCC to six volts, you're driving almost the full six volts into that input for the encoder, right? Whereas if you put 3.3, yeah, you'll lose a little bit. Of, you'll have a little bit of a drop here. It won't be 3.3, it might be 3.25 or something. But basically, it's it's going to be, I think, better set up for what the FPGA is expecting. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's, so the connections there are pretty simple. Um, now, the, the, the complicated part, in my opinion, is the, uh, is the code. Uh, so there's there's a pretty big jump in difficulty for the code part of this lab, but in order to make up for that, I I give you the pseudo code of the whole thing. You just have to transliterate it into C. One of the problems with my code though is that I am using I'm generating the PWM through software, and I found that that is really obnoxious because when you're trying to debug the code. If you go in the debugger, it stops the PWM because the software is stopped, right? Whereas if you had implemented PWM in hardware like we did in lab three, it would keep going independently. I think that's a better way to do it. I think this bit banged PWM stuff is really a bad idea, but in order to make this simple, I, my code was just bit banged and you guys can do this. And you have the option of using a hardware. You'd have to modify your lab three code a little bit to make it just a general PWM. But, um, uh, and you can use the 24 kilohertz speed that we use in lab three, it's fine. Um, I think it's fine anyway. But anyway, this one is bit bang. This is all software control. And so basically, it just while true, it reads the counter, the cycle counter, and then it modulos that by two to the 12th power to get a 24 kilohertz um, PWM signal. Now, I'm not sure, you know, the other problem with this too is that the presumption here is that you're, that this loop is running at 24 kilohertz, right? I think it probably does, but it's kind of hard to tell though, right? <laughs> I don't know. It should be. Um, but the more code you put in this loop, the less likely it'll be that it'll, you'll get a clean PWM signal out. So that's the other problem with this. Not real thrilled about it. I wish I would have done it with a hardware PWM. But you guys could do it however you want. But basically, uh, yeah, this is the PWM progress. So this gives you a number between zero and then two to the 12th minus one, which is 2047. So zero to 2047 tells you how far through the PWM period we got, right? And of course, if you have the duty cycle, the duty cycle will be also in, in that range. Okay. And then, so yeah, the duty cycle is two to the 14th times the absolute value of the motor input, because remember, it could, it could be negative or positive technically. Anyway, which way do you want to go? 
And then if the speed is negative, then we're going to use the, the one PWM output. If it's positive or zero, we'll use the other one. And that's because, remember, the H-bridge has two pairs of transistors that, are, that, that have to get separate PWMs, and it's mutually exclusive. You can only use one pair or the other. So this if statement is going to guarantee that only one of these guys is, uh, is set at a time. However, uh, I should have set them both to zero before that, though, just to be, just to be safe. Because there's a possibility that if you switch directions, you may leave one on. So yeah, that you could, you could initialize those, it's probably a good idea. But yeah, the point is, is that this just checks forward or backward and the indenting somehow got screwed up there. But if you give it the good old if, else if, and then the else, that should never happen. Yeah. Yeah, I should. Or just set PWM zero in, in here to, to zero and PW one in here to zero. Oh, that's that's the, really good. Uh, okay, so this reads the encoder, and then this detects the rising edge. Now, in my code, I use both encoder inputs. So I have a previous encoder zero and previous encoder one, and the current encoder zero, current encoder one. And that's because I'm, I'm trying to use, I, I basically reassess my understanding of the motor speed after e any rising edge on either encoder input, right? That way I can have the most up-to-date value, right? Because both encoder inputs are the same thing. Only differences are out of phase to indicate the direction the motor is spinning. So I just basically just read them both. You don't have to do that. You can just read one, okay? Because you only care about one direction. Um, you can tell the direction by Judging the phase is what they should do. Yes. The, yeah, yeah. The way I do that is um, basically because they're 180 degrees out of phase, whenever, whenever I get a rising edge on encoder zero, if encoder one is already one at this point, then I know it's going one direction. And if it was already zero, it's going the other direction. Right? I don't know if this is the best way to do it, but I'm assuming they're pretty much, um, they're pretty much, in, they're 180 degrees out of phase. And I think these encoders, I think it's a 50% duty cycle which means that they're basically complemented relative to one another. So if one of them is one and the other is zero, right, I think, I think you can use that to tell which direction. Um, I believe that works. Again, this is a little experimental. I don't know if that's the best way to do it. Um, I mean, it worked for me because I was able to generate that plot. And it, of course, that plot that I showed you had the direction correct. Okay, and then compute external shaft speed. It's just an equation. So it's the pulse period divided by 12, which is because there's 12 pulses per rotation, and then divided by 50 because there's a 50 to 1 year ratio, and then times 60 because I'm going from per second to per minute. Are the 12 pulses per full rotation the external shaft? <clears throat> That's the internal shaft. It's the internal shaft. Yeah. Full, well, I guess full rotation for both are the same, right? Yeah. Is that in the data sheet for the motor? Yes. Yeah. 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 That's where I got that from. Okay. Um, I thought that, but then I was like, I want to ask just in case. If you go to the motor, it has has it in there somewhere. Wait, uh, I thought the external shafts rotate at the same speed. Why the gearbox? Well, no, they don't. I'm sorry. the The internal shaft, it's gonna you're gonna get actually 12 times 50 pulses for the external shaft per rotation. Uh, or no, sorry, the external shaft. When the external shaft rotates once, then the internal shaft is rotated 50 times. Yeah, so you'll get, you'll actually get, yeah, you'll get, I said it right. It would be 600 pulses per rotation of the outer shaft, of the external shaft because of the gearbox. Okay. Um, um, it was in there somewhere. It's in there somewhere, yeah. I believe you. Okay, uh, so that calculates the motor RPM. And then, now th this is the other issue that you have to be careful of. So I'm, trying, I'm running that outer loop as fast as it'll go. And so and the, the motor RPM is calculated at the fastest rate that the software will go, right? But I don't want to perform control decisions at that same speed. Uh, I mean, you could, but then the problem is, is that it's difficult to control the time step for the controller, the TS. That we talked about in the real the uh, control uh, the control you know discrete controllers have a time step, and so we want to be able to control the time step. So this code just determines how long it's been since the last time I invoked the control, and I only want to invoke the control at like 100 hertz, 
Okay, so in other words, all this stuff is running at fastest speed possible, but the controller is running at TS, which is the, the time the sample rate for the controller. And so I only go in there and then I'm calculating the error. So I have a set point. The error is just the current motor RPM minus the set point. This is where I want it to rotate at. Uh, the error accumula accumulated error is that that's used for the integral part of the PID controller. And then the delta is the derivative of the error. And the, these, these error values, the derivative and the integral are also being calculated at the time step, not, not you know, at the full speed. Right. And then the controller is just literally a PID. You guys remember that from 274. And then we want to log this stuff so we can, you know, print it. Okay. When I say log it, I mean just record these values in an array that you can print out at the end. And the, time, the whole thing will shut down after time. If time since start is greater than time, then, then uh, you set the stop flag, which should stop everything. Um, now, after it stops, you should print the log. I don't show that here, but that would be where you print all your values out so you can plot them if you want to. So it's really just a matter of, um, most of this relies on just reading values and reading the performance count or keeping track of the time. Okay, any questions about that? All of this to just build an analog clock, essentially, to convert a 50. So we're, we're basically converting a 50 megahertz crystal that's on the board to a mechanical kind of second hand on a motor using a DC motor. I was always fascinated by the fact that people say like you can tell like a real Rolex watch because the, the second hand is a, kind of a smooth, it moves smoothly. It doesn't move just once per second like a cheap, cheap uh, wrist watch. Does. Um, so this should hopefully create that nice smooth Rolex style second hand. Um, now, it may be the case that you can't actually get it to run, you know, if you have trouble running it that slow, because, you know, keep in mind that, um, you know, if it's just rotating at once, it's just one RPM, right? You know, you're really going to be, you know, you're going to be 150. I mean, so ideally, you're trying to hold it at right around here, right, which is really close to, I mean, if you look at the blue line, now, now to be fair though, I mean, all of your, all of your, all of your uh, control here seems to be between 0 0.4 0 0.6, but you're going to be right, it should be right around 0.4 to get it to go that slow, right? It may be difficult to get it to go that slow, which that's fine. You can always change the set point, have it go, it doesn't have to be one I don't care if it's one revolution per minute, it could be faster, right? As long as the point is, is that you can control it. You wanna be able to control the rotational speed using the feedback control. Okay? So, yeah, and then, like I said, if, if you guys seen the clocks that we built with the 3D print, so we 3D printed those, those cases and we put the motor in there and then I think it looks pretty cool. We didn't have that last year. This is, like I said, this, this lab's totally new. Um, moving forward, the goal is to do more, more complex things. Like hopefully next year, we're going to have a pendulum that we can control reaction real pendulum. I have, um, we actually built one of those and we built a self-balancing pen, uh, robot too, but we never, we couldn't get them to work <laughs> yet. So this stuff is, uh, it, it could be, it's more challenging than, than I expected it to be. So just getting that second hand to work, I would be happy if we can get that going. Okay, so last lecture, we were talking about real-time scheduling. And so this is a return back to like a conceptual topic. We're not gonna be implementing this in a lab, uh, but this is a fundamental thing that you have to understand in order to do cyber, in order to build cyber physical systems. Uh, we talked in the last lecture about the time step, the T sub S, so discrete controllers operate on a time step. You have to make sure that you whatever you're doing for the control meets the time step. So that becomes a deadline that you have to meet. If you miss the deadline, then re remember we talked about stability, bounded input, bounded output stability. And so if you have a feedback loop controller, 
it should be stable for any input, right? Any input should give you a bounded output, right? But if you design the controller to be bounded for a given time step, you're only guaranteeing that it's stable for that time step. So if you miss the time step, if you don't achieve the time step, in other words, if you miss your deadline, then the system could become unstable. So in other words, if you have like a, you know, some, you know, cruise control or something on a car, if the, if the processor is not able to keep up with the physical world, it, if it gets behind, then you end up, you know, the system becomes unstable, you lose control, right? So the problem is how do you guarantee that? Because if you run this on Linux, Linux makes no guarantees. In fact, if you run this on Linux, you would be surprised how uncertain the execution time for tasks are. It varies wildly uh, under Linux. You think, come on, really? I mean, what, what's going on with that? It's just, I don't know. It's just stuff, there's, there's, there's so many events happening in Linux that are, that are unpredictable. There's, there's interrupts and page faults and cache misses and TLB misses and other tasks that are grabbing control of the processor. There's cron jobs and all that other kind of stuff. There's no way to guarantee execution time in Linux. It's just not a real-time operating system. So generally what you'll see is, is um, real-time controllers run on bare metal like we are in this class, but even then the execution time is not, is not certain because you still have interrupts uh, that are happening um, and cache misses. So if you really want deterministic runtime, you have to use FPGA logic which is why in Simulink and in MATLAB, they really emphasize that when you create a controller in Simulink, they have a way to generate, you know, Verilog for that. So you can get deterministic behavior. Uh, that's something else I'd like to do eventually in this class. We, we're not there yet. Um, so when you run a task, generally what you'll see is the execution time is usually follows a normal distribution. So there's a mean and there's a standard deviation or variance there. Um, if you're talking about communication channels, like latency of a wire uh, or latency of a network packet sending from one machine, that's usually an exponential distribution. But execution time is usually more normal. It's usually normally, not always, but usually normally distributed. So for example, if you, if you sample the execution time and you want to be able to find the worst case execution time, then you can, you can only calculate it with a certain confidence. And so um, if you take the mean and you add 3.719 standard deviations, that will give you the worst case execution time with a 99.99% confidence. Right? So all you can do is you know, estimate the worst case execution time. It's, it's, you can't really bound it when you have a distribution like this. The other thing that you may see too is that the execution time may actually be a mixture of distributions. In this case, you can see there's almost, it looks like there's almost two normal distributions superimposed on one another. And that can happen if there's an if statement in your code where the amount of workload changes depending on the input. Now, PID controllers don't have an if statement, um, but in our code there was. Remember we had that if statement for TS that was measuring, you know, if you hit the TS, there was an if statement. There was also some if statements to check the motor direction, although those are balanced. But um, sometimes you'll see that. If you know that ahead of time, you can model this as two, two distributions mixed, and then you can get a better estimate of the worst case execution time. So we, we talked about that last time, how you do that. Um, and then, um, so a worse, a, a real-time execution time is gonna have a scheduler in it, much like any operating system. And tasks have, one of three main states. They, they could be ready where they want to execute, but they can't because someone else has get, got the CPU. Another task is running on the CPU. Uh, they could be asleep, in which case they're not ready to run anything, or they could be you know, currently assigned or currently running on a, a CPU. So, those, so ready, asleep, and, and execute them. Um, and then if you have a set of tasks that have various, this computation time would be like the worst case execution time, and then there's an associated deadline. Uh, the number of ways that you can, you know, this is assuming that they're non-periodic, so you just run each once, and they're non-preemptive. So once you start one, it runs to completion. And even under those assumptions, there's 24 ways that you can schedule those tasks, and only two of them actually meet the deadlines. So the one, one of them is this number two, where you run task four, 
Okay, so task four has the CPU and then it finishes. Task three gets it after that, and then it finishes, then task one gets it, and then task two gets it. And each one of these finishes before their deadline, which is marked by these little lines here put on there. Um, and it turns out that that one is actually, it's four, three, one, two. So we're going four, three, one, two. And if you look at that, four, three, one, two. I think that's actually the, the forget which one that is not. <laughs> uh, that one is the least slack first. So slack is the difference between the execution time and the deadline. It's the amount of time left over that it doesn't have to run, you know, the time that it doesn't need to be running within its deadline. So that number two is the least slack first, and number eight was the earliest deadline first, right? So those are like just rules of, like scheduling rules that you can follow policies, scheduling policies. Um, so other ones like shortest task first, in this case it didn't work. That would have been number 15. Uh, schedule order 15. Okay, but uh, normally real-time systems are control. They're for control, and so they're periodic, meaning that they're supposed to be invoked uh, according to a period, much like, you know, lab four. Um, in lab four, we're assuming that the period is 100, uh, one millisecond, right? 100 hertz, right? one millisecond. So we want to make control decisions every one millisecond. The execution time is how long it takes to execute the code, but we're not measuring that in lab four. We probably should, or hopefully. I, I think it should run fast enough to fulfill that. But, you know, of course, you can always adjust the period, too. Um, okay, so, but normally, yeah, they're periodic, and then, uh, so, so generally, the period is also the deadline, so after every new period, the tasks... Uh, the task associated with that period becomes ready to run. So it kind of releases or it triggers. And then it has until the end of the period to finish doing whatever it has to do. Uh, so in that case, um, the, the feasibility test is if you add up the execution time divided by the period for all the tasks, that will give you the utilization. And so that utilization has to be less than 100% or it's not feasible. So with the set of tasks that I gave you, these four tasks, if you add up the, the utilization, 40 over 76 plus 6 over 84 plus 14 over 35 plus 20 over 37, it actually adds up to more than, it adds up to 1.5, right? So there's no way to schedule this if these were periodic. Now, I did schedule it, but that was assuming they weren't periodic, so I was only, they're only going once, right? But if you have this idea where they, they they're the notion that they have to re reissue after every period, you can't, this is non, non schedule at least on one CPU. You can't schedule these. Um, so there's two well-known ways to do periodic real-time scheduling, assuming that tasks can be preempted. So the, the problem is, is that if you have a task running you know, the, the idea is that you're running whatever task has the highest priority at the time. The problem is, is that whenever a task goes from asleep to ready, meaning it woke up, it's starting a new period, the priorities may shift, right? And so you have to be able to interrupt whatever task is running and kick it out, even though it's not done. You have to shift it from executing back to ready in order to accommodate a new task with a higher priority that suddenly becomes ready to go because it's period started, right? So, so these are for, these only work for preemptive real-time schedulers where you can preempt, meaning you can, you can interrupt a task that is currently executing in order to bring another task in that's ready, a newly ready task, right? Um, so the two earliest deadline first will give highest priority. Uh, of all the tasks that are currently ready, the one that has the earliest deadline will have the highest priority, right? And then rate monotonic scheduling is gives highest priority to whatever task is is low has the shortest period. Make sense, right? Um, earliest deadline first is optimal, 
As long as the utilization is less than 100%, it will work. The problem with it is that no, no one uses it because the priorities are constantly changing. Uh, when I say constantly, I mean whenever a new task becomes ready, you have to reassign all the priorities for every task. Every time a new task becomes goes from sleep to ready. In other words, it's new period begins, right? With rate monotonic scheduling, because it's only based on the period, it has a static priority scheme. And so the tasks, th their priority never changes. Now you still though have to preempt. So even with RMS, you may have to kick a process out and reschedule whenever a new task becomes ready, but you don't have to recalculate all the priorities. That's the difference, right? So, um, so let me give you an example of that. So here's a task set, this is three tasks. We've got 10 milliseconds, 40 milliseconds for the period, 15 milliseconds and 50, mil, 50 milliseconds, five milliseconds, 20 milliseconds. Utilization here is 80%. So that's 10 over 40 plus 15 over 50 plus 5 over 20. That adds up to 80%. So it's feasible. So if you generate those, you'll get the following using, this is earliest deadline first. So task three is going to run first. Why? Well, because it's, they all start out ready at the beginning. And so task three's deadline is going to be 20. So it has the earliest deadline, 20. So it's going to go first. And it's going to run until completion. When it finishes, we're only left with task one and two that are ready. And of those, task one is a higher priority because its deadline is at 40. So it goes until it completes. And then task two goes. Now here's the problem. Task two, when task two runs, um, task, it's the only one that can run. It's the only one that's ready at this point. The problem is, is that task three will interrupt. It will, its new period will start at 20 milliseconds. So task two gets preempted. See, it runs for a little bit, but as soon as task three releases, starts a new period, then it's going to take over. And task two gets put back to sleep until task three finishes, at which point task two gets to finish. Right? Now, notice here, at this point, when it finishes, no one's running. So CPU is idle not very long. But technically, the CPU is idle, see, zero, 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 until task three period starts again. And check this out. Task, do those start at the same time? Yeah. See, task one and three are harmonic, right? Meaning that task, task one is a harmonic of task three because it has doubled the period. So those guys are going to come up at the same time, right there at 20 milliseconds. See, both of them, both of them become ready at the same time. But it doesn't matter because task three has the higher priority, so it gets to go, and then task one gets to go. Meanwhile, task two becomes ready there, but it has to wait for task, excuse me, task one to finish. Make sense? So, so you have to, every time a new period starts, you have to potentially uh, re reschedule. I mean, and by scheduling, I mean decide who gets the CPU and who has to be put to sleep. Uh, uh, not not put to sleep, but who gets to go to rent? Sleep is when they finish their work for that period. They go to sleep. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so rate monotonic scheduling is uh, s similar, except it's just based on the, the only difference is that the priorities are based on the period. But again, you still have to potentially reschedule after any task period starts. Uh, so in this case, you get the following. Uh, you can see the task three, because it has the shortest period, every time it comes up, every time there is a red line here, it gets the next period, because it has the highest priority. See that? When it's scheduling tasks with the shortest period, does it mean the shortest period remaining? Like the shortest slack? No, just the shortest the, period. Just the period, okay. yeah, in general. So we'll always give like three priorities right. to everybody. Yeah, you can see that. See, every time that red line comes, boom, it goes. It goes every time, right? It's very, it's very regular. Task two has the lowest priority. Task one has the set. So task one will go whenever task three is is done, uh, until it or until task one, and then task two only. Basically, task two only executes when task three, one, and three are. Actually, it's whatever's left. It's whatever's left over. Yeah, it gets the leftovers. Right? Yeah. So you can see that it gets preempted a lot. So you've got, you see it gets preempted there, there. Here it actually doesn't. 
And, you know, the reason is because of just the way these work out. Like, because these only two of these are harmonic, this one's not. So it just so happens that on this period, task two gets to gets to run to completion without being preemptive, just because the other two tasks just happen to not not be ready during that time. So um, yeah, I had to write a I wrote a program that generates these. Um, this is actually these waveforms I generated with a LaTeX package called um, Teeks. Um, and Teeks has a timing diagram. So I had to write a C program that would schedule these and then it generates LaTeX code, which I then compiled into a PDF and put into a graphic. But so I actually wrote this schedule. I hope I'm, I'm assuming I did it right. It should be correct. But basically the idea is, is every time one becomes ready, you have to decide who has the highest priority. Now, here's the problem, though. Uh, there is a downside. So EDF is optimal. It'll run. It'll work as long as the utilization is less than 100%. Rate monotonic scheduling is not that good, unfortunately. Um, it, it won't necessarily work even if the utilization is less than 100%. Because it, it, it's not, it's, 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 it's flawed because it doesn't, it's, it's a static priority. And so um, here's an example, actually. So here's a task set. 4 over 10 plus 3 over 12 plus 5 over 15 adds up to 98.3%. So it's less than 100%. I should be able to schedule these guys. And it turns out that... Um, with e EDF, I can schedule, but with RMS, I actually miss a deadline right there. And it's funny thing is that, the weird thing about this is that it's hard to even predict what, you know, so, so basically RMS failed, but it didn't fail at the beginning. It didn't fail until way over here. And this guy, task three, misses his deadline right there. Can't, it can't do it, okay? So the question is, how do you know if RMS is gonna work or not? Well, actually, this has been a, um, this has been a really, this is one of those problems um, in computer science that it's not actually solved. It's, so they have bounds, right? So they have basically the, a bound. You calculate a bound, and if the bound holds, it's guaranteed to work, right? But if the bound fails, it may or may not work. You don't know. That's the problem. So when, when they, th th this RMS algorithm was proposed uh, I think in the early 80s by these two guys, Lou and Leyland, and they calculated a bound of 69%. As long as, the, as long as the utilization was less than 69, they said RMS is guaranteed to work, which is, was true. But it wasn't a tight bound. And since that time, they've come up with a tighter bound, a tighter bound that will do a, that'll, they'll do a schedulability test. So the way it works is, is, and I don't know how this was derived, I don't know how they derived this, but this was a big deal when they figured this out. Um, and there may even be a tighter bound than this that exists. But as far as I know, the state-of-the-art schedulability bound for RMS is, is you take, you, for each task, you take one plus the time over the period, you multiply all those together, and if the product of all those sub-expressions is less than or equal to two, then it's guaranteed to work. If it's greater than two, that doesn't automatically mean it's not going to work, unless, of course, the utilization is, I mean, the utilizations are 100% guaranteed not to work, right? But if, if this bound fails, but it's still less than 100% utilization, you'll never know. Because it may even work for a while. Because, like, like let's, say, let, let's say, you know, oh, this fails. I'm going to try it. See if it fails in practice, right? But you don't know, you don't even know how long you have to run it before it'll fail. It may take, you know, you may have to, it may fail after 100 years of running, right? Because like, you don't know. Like you notice that example I showed before, it worked for a while and then it screwed up, right? So, but anyway, that's, that's how you calculate it. So for example, if I have the following three tasks, 10 over 40, 15 over 55 over 20, you basically just say 1 plus 10 over 40 times 1 plus 15 over 50 times 1 plus 5 over 20. You add those up and you get 1.95, which is less than 2, less than or equal to 2, so these will work. This one, on the other hand, 4 over 10, 3 over 12, 5 over 15, gives 2.33. Now, the utilization is less than 100%, so EDF will schedule either one of these. RMS 
may not schedule this task set, but it will definitely schedule this task set. So that's, like I said, that's the current, I think that's the latest RMS bound. Someone might have come up with one better. Okay, now there is a caveat there. If all of the periods are mutually harmonic, and I think this is a, a relatively recent result too, uh, meaning that you know mutually harmonic means that if you pick any two tasks, um, one will be a, a multiple of the other, right? Uh, so every pair of tasks are a multiple period. Uh, in this case, 20, 40, and 80 are the periods. You can actually use RMS to get 100% utilization, but that's rarely the case, right? Usually the periods are not harmonic. They're just, you know, it depends on the controller design. Okay, so now, as you might imagine, um, that was for one CPU. What if you have a multi-core CPU and you want to do real-time scheduling? That becomes even more difficult. Um, so there's two appro approaches here. There's um, one approach is partition scheduling, which is where you, you basically just statically assign each task to its own processor, and then you schedule each processor independently from one another. In which case, you just basically all you do is you take your task set and you partition it right in, into different processors, and then you just use uniprocessors, real-time scheduling. Okay, that's one approach. Another approach, the more interesting one, is global scheduling, where you allow any task to be running on any processor at any time, right? But this is a much harder problem. Uh, by the way, with partition scheduling, you can do partition scheduling if you want to do an exhaustive search, though, you'd have to do, you know, if there's M processors and N tasks, and you want to fully enumerate M raised to the N power ways to do the partitioning, right? So that, that, that explodes. If you have a lot of tasks, that's a problem. Otherwise, if you have a small number of tasks, you can just exhaustively search for a partition schedule that works. If you have too many tasks to do that, then you want to do global scheduling, ideally. But how do you do global scheduling? Well, there's two of these that I found. I'm sure there's more, because this is they have whole conferences devoted to, to this stuff. But one of the ways to do it is called rate monotonic first fit periodic scheduling. And it sounds complicated, but it's pretty simple. You just assign a task to the first processor that passes the single CPU RMS schedulability test with, along with the other tasks that you've already assigned to it. So it's a greedy algorithm. Um, now, if you do that, then um, you, this will work. Now, by the way, it, really what you're doing here is, what you're doing here is once you assign a task, you're basically getting a partitioned type scheme, right? But so basically you start out with a set of tasks and a set of CPUs, and you do this step to assign each task to its own CPU, and then you just run RMS within those task sets, right? Um, now, if you do that and you run it, there's a new, there's a schedulability test for this, and it's not a great one, unfortunately. It's not, I mean, it's not, it's, it's not, it actually kind of sucks because basically you add up the T over P, the time over the period, right? You just add them like we did when we calculate utilization. So this is just utilization, basically. You calculate the utilization, and the utilization, if it's less than M times 2 uh, to the 1 half power, so square root of 2 minus 1, right, uh, which is 0.41, I think, yeah, 0 0.41, because the square root of 2 is 1.41, right? Um, M is the number of processors. So basically what this is saying is that the, the total utilization has to be less than or equal to 41% of the number of processors. So in other words, you basically only get 41% of each of your processors in a multiprocessor. So if I have 10 processors, then basically I can only fill up uh, the utilization up to 4.1. 4 Right, so I basically get 4.1 4. processors of value out of 10 processors, right? Which, you know, is, like I said, not, not great. Not, not a really good one. Um, so here's an example of that. If we assume that we have two CPUs, that means the utilization is basically 0.82. It has to be less than 0.82, right? 
And so if we have these set of tasks, 2 over 17, 2 over 19, 5 over 21, 7 over 23, uh, you calculate the utilization there, it's 76.5%. Okay, which is uh, not gonna, uh, which is which is good. Okay, right. Seventy six point five is less than point eight two eighty two percent. Right, make sense. Uh, on one CPU, would they would they work on one CPU? Yeah, actually, those this would actually work on one CPU using the RMS schedulability tests on one CPU. But if we're doing multi-CPUs with RMS first fit, then it's 0.82. Uh, is the, is, I mean, is, it, well, it works, in other words, it works on, but I think I was looking for a case where it would work on one, but not on two. I don't think I found one yet. I don't know if that's possible. Okay, uh, here's an example. Um, two CPUs and those tasks. So utilization is 78%. Uh, so that's good too. That passes. That passes for two CPUs, but doesn't pass for one because this is the RMS bound for one CPU. You get two point zero three, and then the multi CPU is seventy eight percent utilization, which is under eighty two. So this is a, this is a task set that will not work on one CPU, but will work on two CPUs using that first fit RMS, but barely. <laughs> Right, barely, barely meets the bound. Okay, so <clears throat> now another approach is uh, earliest deadline first. Is that the full name? Hold on a second, uh, let me go back. So the earliest deadline first on multi CPUs uh, is where you sort tasks by priority and you assign an EDF order, okay? So in order to demonstrate this, I've got two CPUs and what I'm showing is I've color-coded these. I've got task one is purple, task two is blue, task three is red, task four is gray, task five is green. And I'm showing the, the periods here with these boxes. So you can see that there's the red box. This is task three. The green one is task two. So you start a new period here. The blue one is task two, starts a new period here. And then task one is uh, the whole thing. The whole thing is task one. This whole thing is 40, I'm oh, sorry, task four and, and task one, rather, right? Yeah, yeah, task one and task four are both 40, 40 millisecond period. Okay, so at the beginning of this, I have a ready list of all the tasks are ready at the beginning. So I'm going to do earliest deadline first. So who has the earliest deadline? Uh, task three. So I'm going to put task three on CPU one. And so who has the next earliest deadline? That would be task two. No, task five. Task five has got a deadline in 12, 12 time units from time zero, right? Because it's 15 minus three. Task three had a deadline of 16. Or no, sorry, six, 10 minus four, six, right? And uh, so it was six. So T3 had a deadline in six units, six milliseconds. Task uh, five has a deadline of 12 milliseconds. So I'm gonna put task five next, okay? Now, ironically, you know, task five has a longer deadline, but it's a shorter execution time, okay? So then starting from after task five finishes, which one is next? Probably three, five, uh, T2. T2 has a deadline that's 20 minus eight is 12, but I'm starting at three. So it's actually nine, nine milliseconds from this point, I get a deadline. So I'm gonna go T2. Oh, by the way, yeah. So after T5 finishes, my ready list is T1, T2, and T4 of those T2 is the one that's got the highest priority, so I'm going to stick T2 on there. Okay, now, after T3 finishes, my ready list is T1 and T4, and so those ones, T1, they both have the same period, 40. So their deadline is going to be the same. The deadline is after, is going to be in 
36 milliseconds from that point. So I'm going to put T1 there. So when T1 finishes, um, when T1 finishes, um, the ready list is, let's see. So T3 is available again, because T3 is going to start a new period there, right? So T3 is going to pop up. T4, I haven't even scheduled yet. So he's still ready. And then T1, uh, T1, oh, T1 isn't done. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, T1 is ready. Actually, T1 is executing at that point, right? But it didn't finish because that's a, execution time is 24. So he's not done, right? So he's running, he's executing, but he's also ready, technically. So who's going to go? Are we going to let T1 finish or are we going to preempt him? Um, I think we're going to have to preempt him because T3 is got uh, basically just 10. Its deadline is in 10, right? So T3 has, has got to finish by this point, whereas T1 has got until 40, and we're at 10, so he's got 30 milliseconds left. So I'm preempting T1. I'm going to put T3 on there. So T3 gets to go, and then we can reevaluate after T2 finishes. So after T2 finishes, we just have T1 and T4. So I'll just go ahead and start T1 again since I since I ran them already. So I'm gonna let T1 finish. I think T1 will finish there. And then after T3 finishes, then of course it's T4's time, turn. But not for long because T4 only gets a little sliver because the problem is, is that this green line indicates that T5 is up and ready to go again. So T4 gets, gets a little bit of time to run and then he's gonna to have to be preempted by um, T5. Make sense? So that's essentially how this works. You, you, it's the same sort of thing as EDF, except it's multi-processor. You have to reevaluate uh, each time something uh, comes up. So he keeps going with that. Okay, so for that scheme, um, now this is where it gets a little crazy. For that scheme, remember I said for EDF with one processor, as long as the utilization is under 100%, it'll work. But that's not the case with this the multiprocessor version of EDF. So there's two conditions. Um, the first condition is that the utilization has to be less than or equal to M, which is the number of processors. So that, that makes sense, right? If you have two processors, you can't have more than 200% um, utilization, uh, which is similar to the, you know, the normal EDF test. But there's a second condition. Um, and for this one, you have to calculate the greatest common divisor of all the periods. So what would that be? It looks like five, yeah. That's T. And then you multiply that T by each, by each of the individual ratios between runtime and period. Okay? Yeah. So you take T, which is five, and you multiply five times 24 over 40. And you multiply 5 times 8 over 20, and you multiply 5 by 4 over 10, and so forth. When you do that, as long as all of those values that you get are integers, then you can schedule with EDF. How would you not get an integer? Uh, see, I have an example here where, okay, so this is 5, as we said, and U is 2, that's the number of processors, or utilization is 2, rather, sorry. So actually, oh, in this case, yeah, this is kind of wild. So if you add up the utilizations, it adds up to two. So if it works, it's going to fill every, like you'll never have, there will be no time when the processors are, either processor is idle. Uh, again, that's assuming worst case execution. Okay, so, um, so you know, does, is it going to work? Well, five times 24 over 40 is three, that's an integer. Five times eight over 20 is an integer. Five times four over 10 is an integer. Five times 16 over 40 is an integer. Five times three. So that works. So it turns out that would work. And there's another example here. This is another example where it doesn't work. So in this case, we have 40, 20, 12, 40, 16. Utilization is, again, two. So the, the greatest common divisor is four here. And 
No, not the utilization. Times the, the well, utilization of that individual product. Yeah, the individual. Yeah. yeah. So four times three over 16, which is task, this fourth task, is 0.8. So this one fails the test. Now, again, that doesn't mean it's not going to work. It just means it's, it's not guaranteed to work, but it's not guaranteed to not work. So it may work, may not work. It's too risky, though. You wouldn't want to have, um, you know, you wouldn't want to deploy this because you'd, you'd risk it blowing up. But it's the whole question is about, you know, you're looking for a guarantee that it'll work or may or may not work, right? Um, so anyway, that's it. That's all I've got for that for that section. Any questions? In practice, would it be reasonable to add time to your period to only ever add time to fiddle with your GCD to see if you can get like a, a guarantee that it would work? Well, that's a good you'd question. also have to recalculate your total utilization with your yeah. cynical periods. Right. Yeah, that's a good you're, point. You're up to the edge on your utilization, then you can't add extra time. Well, you've got a lot of margin. Actually, if, if the execution time stays constant and the periods increase, then the utilization would actually uh, that would go down. Oh, the, prob the problem is, is that no, you can't increase the period. You have to increase the execution time. Well, you could increase the period if you updated your controller design, though. Right? Uh -huh. So the controller, so the controller, if you if you give yourself a better control algorithm, you could potentially tolerate a longer period. But that depends on the control theory part. You have to go back and make sure that your controller is stable for a longer period. 